All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here now. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all um, to today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and finding the time out of your uh, busy day post-lunch hour uh, to join us in this very important conversation uh, that we're going to have for the next hour. Uh, so before we begin, I, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, so for those of you that are um, just now logging on um, and aren't connected to audio yet, um, the call-in information is here on the left side, um, so make sure you dial in so that you're able um, to hear today's webinar presentation. Um, and if you do experience any technical difficulties calling in, uh, please send uh, a message uh, via the chat box um, and we'll be more than happy to help troubleshoot any issues. Uh, this webinar is currently being recorded. Um, and will be available um, within the next few days uh, on our website. And any accompanying materials, including uh, the slide deck, uh, will be shared uh, with you all as well uh, on our website. Um, everybody should be in listen-only mode. Uh, so if you have any questions that come up uh, throughout the duration of today's presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, box um, on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll be taking momentary pauses uh, throughout uh, the webinar to answer your questions. Um, there will also be um, some time allocated at the end of the presentation to address questions as well. Uh, so a few quick round of introductions. Uh, so. Uh, my name is Peter Lay. I will be uh, the moderator uh, for today's webinar. Um, I'm the program manager at the California School-Based Health Alliance, um, and we're really excited uh, to have uh, today's webinar uh, with the Children's Partnership. Um, and so today's presenter, um, Aurora Garcia Barrera, uh, Community Engagement Manager at the Children's Partnership, uh, will be leading today's conversation. Um, and to give you a little bit um, of background information about the California School-Based Health Alliance, uh, we're the statewide nonprofit organization that's dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. And so we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we support uh, school districts um, and individual schools with school-based health center startup and sustainability, uh, and we also uh, provide support with uh, programs um, at school-based health centers. Um, to learn more about the work that we do, uh, feel free to visit us at schoolhealthcenters.org. I also invite you all uh, to become a member of our organization where you can get uh, exclusive benefits, including uh, discount um, to our annual conference, um, which we'll talk about at the end of today's presentation. You'll also get access to our members-only tools and resources, um, and you'll also be able um, to get some technical assistance with us um, with your school-based health center programming. Um, so the link to sign up um, is there for your reference, um, and uh, by becoming a member, you can support us um, carry out uh, this incredible work that we're doing statewide. And with that, I will pass it off to our presenter, um, Aurora Garcia Barrera. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining this webinar and for inviting uh, the Children's Partnership to speak. I know um, last year we did a presentation focused on um, creating safe spaces in schools. Um, so this year we're going to be talking about public charge, which is another issue that impacts um, uh, immigrant students and immigrant families and, um, and everyone uh, in those communities. So just to begin with, uh, just a little bit about TCP. So we're a California-based national children's advocacy organization. Um, we are committed to improving the lives of underserved children where they live, learn, and play um, with big breakthrough solutions at the intersection of research, policy, and community engagement. Um, and we're actually celebrating our 25th year, so we've been around for quite a bit. <laughs> 
Um, so just a quick overview of the agenda of what I'm going to be covering today. So I just want to give you a little bit of context in terms of why um, these uh, issues around immigration um, are important to us as a kids advocacy organization. Um, and then I'm going to spend the majority of the time speaking about public charge, just giving you all an overview of what it is and where we are with that right now. Um, I'll be sharing some resources and then just um, sort of uh, recapping for those that joined before or um, sharing some, a little bit of information about how we can be supporting immigrant families and students during these very difficult times um, in immigrant communities. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Great. So um, just to start off with, um, why is this? Why are these issues so important to us? Um, because um, half of the, the kids here in California have um, at least one uh, Im immigrant parent. Um, so this is a huge population um, of, of kids here in California, um, and, and it covers a quarter nationally. So the issues that impact immigrant uh, kids or kids and immigrant families are very important to us. Um, this is just uh, some um, data on how over the last few decades um, what children look like has changed dramatically and it continues to change. So as you see, there's been an increase in children that have at least one immigrant parent. Um, just as a quick, some quick background. Um, since the Trump administration um, came in, there have been a, a, a slew of, a, of a federal actions that have really impacted immigrant families. Whether any of these changes have come to fruition or not, um, what we know that they have created is a chilling effect where folks are scared. Um, they're, they're, they fear for family separation. They fear for usage of, ben of benefits that they're entitled to. Um, they they fear what their future uh, may look like because of all of these um, threats that they keep hearing about. Um, so these are some of the things that have um, happened since. So we've seen multiple anti-immigration executive orders um, be either rumored or moved. Um, we we saw the decision of the Deferred Action Program and um, the 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 same with um, temporary protective status. Um, we have seen a shift in enforcement priorities. So what used to, before they used to focus on more like violent crimes, um, and now they have changed the, the definition of, of what type of immigrants are considered a priority for, for immigration enforcement or detention and deportation. And then we've also been hearing um, around the changes that are happening to public charge, where which really are aimed at changing what immigration looks like in the country, who is able to migrate here, um, with an emphasis on wealthier folks um, being able to come into the country, and those who are suffering in their home countries are having a lot more difficulty um, coming here. So we'll get into that in just a bit. Um, so just before I get started on the public charge piece, um, I do just want to preface that um, I am not an attorney, so I am not uh, uh, able to provide legal advice, but the information that we are offering um, reflects some of the, the most current updates around public charge, and um, throughout it all, we do recommend that folks speak to an attorney to get more um, accurate information about their individual cases. So if you all will be taking the information that we share on this webinar and talking about it with your students or with the folks that you work with, um, we just recommend that that you don't that you don't provide um, any advice because um, immigration cases are very sensitive. So we do want to really emphasize the importance of communicating um, and talking with with attorneys um, to make the best decisions around their cases. And um, towards the end of the presentation, I will be sharing some resources um, around legal support, um, and so um, we can direct folks there. So 
So what is public charge? Oh, and as, as um, Peter mentioned, if folks have any questions, feel free to type them on the chat box and I'll try to address them as I go. Um, so public charge is a term that's used by uh, immigration officials to refer to a person who is considered likely to become primarily dependent on the government for subsistence. Um, so folks, when, our, when folks are going through the immigration adjustment process, um, they will be subject to a, what's considered a, um, what's called a public charge test. And I'll talk about the test in a little bit in more detail. But again, this, this is a test that will be used to determine whether a person may at some point become uh, reliant on government um, financial assistance. Um, and so the reason for that is to um, determine whether a person should be admitted um, into the country or be given a lawful permanent residency. Um, so that's what the public charge test is used for. In terms of um, public benefits that are currently considered, so when the public charge test is given, um, some of the, the specific pieces that they look at are um, what public benefits folks are utilizing. And so um, current law only has a few benefits on there. And so these are um, cash assistance. So that could look like the TANF program, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which in California it's known as CalWORKs, um, it's also recognized as like the EBT card, and then Social Security Income or SSI. And then also if a person is utilizing long-term medical care through Medicaid, so an example of that is, you know, being institu institutionalized in a mental health facility. Um, so these are the only two types of benefits that um, current law considers. Um, and so, you, you probably have been hearing a lot about Medi-Cal and SNAP and other programs, and so we'll talk about that in a second, but what is actually applicable now is only these benefits here. So when do folks have to um, go through the public charge test? Um, so there's only a couple of points in which point folks have to go through the public charge test. So when you apply to enter the U.S., when you apply to become a legal permanent resident, so you're seeking to get your green card. Um, and then also, if you are already a legal permanent resident, but you leave the country for more than six months or 180 consecutive days, you uh, may also be subject to the public charge test. So for folks that may, may know, usually when folks become legal permanent residents, you are advised to not leave the country for more than six months. Um, so it's not a very common Thing that folks um, who are already um, residents to be subject to this, but but it it, it can happen. Um, not everyone is not all immigrants are subject to this test, though. So there are some uh, exemptions, and this includes um, refugees and asylees, victims of human trafficking, or folks who are applying um, or who have a T visa. Um, victi victims of domestic violence or other hate crimes, also known as the U visa. Um, there are some uh, special immigrant juvenile status um, categories. There's the VAWA self petitioners. Um, and then folks who are legal permanent residents, again, unless they are leaving the country for more than six months, will not, they're exempt from the public charge test. And then um, legal permanent residents who are applying to become U.S. citizens or folks who are already U.S. citizens are not subject to the public charge test. So these are, I, we always want to emphasize that um, just because you're an immigrant, it doesn't mean that you will be subject to public charge test rules and, and just because you're an immigrant doesn't mean that your usage of benefits will impact your ability to adjust your status. <clears throat> so these are some of the really key messages to share with, with families and, and students and such. Um, in case they fall in any of these categories, they don't even have to worry about public charge. So at the time of the public charge test, um, currently, um, they, uh, immigration officials are not able to just look at your usage of public benefits. They have to look at like your whole picture or what they call a totality of circumstances. 
Um, so there's a few factors that, that um, immigration officials look at to determine whether somebody um, has the ability to, in the future, support themselves solely or whether they would um, need um, government assistance to support themselves. Um, so some of the factors that are considered are uh, a person's age, health, um, their income, any assets that they may have, number of dependents, education, skills, and work experience, and affidavit of support. Um, so oftentimes when you might hear of a family or an individual who is applying to adjust their status to legal permanent residence or to get their green card, you often hear talk about an affidavit of support. Oftentimes when folks have an affidavit of support, um, it's more than enough to, um, to be able to move them through the process and not be considered a public charge. Um, so currently, th these are the factors that they're looking at. And um, so again, just a, a reminder to folks that just the sole use of public benefits will not make a person a public charge. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind as well. So what are the changes to public charge now? Um, so before I get into the specific things that have um, that are changing for public charge that are um, that were finalized to change in public charge, I do want to let folks know that um, there were a set of proposed changes that were finalized August 14, 2019. Uh, so only a couple of months ago, and they were set to be implemented on October the 15th, so this past Tuesday. Um, however, on Friday, October 11th, a New York federal judge blocked these proposed changes, so I wanted to flag this, and I'm going to keep reminding you throughout that the, the proposed changes or the changes um, are cur currently on hold, but this is a very important um, point of view, and I'll get to some key messages in a second, but again, um, there was a Hold up was put on Friday, October 11. After that, shortly after, uh, four additional courts placed preliminary injections, and this includes California, uh, Maryland, and Washington State. And basically, these temporary injunctions put a national freeze on the implementation of the proposed changes to public charge. So in a second, when I start talking about the changes, um, I just want you to keep all of this in mind, that nothing has moved forward yet. It's not being implemented currently. Um, and we are going to do our best to keep folks updated on how that's moving forward, but for now, um, it's on hold. So just a few key messages on the injections. For those of us who have been working on or have been monitoring and pushing back on public charge for what seems a lifetime now, um, this is a huge victory. Um, we tried to to stop the the proposed changes from becoming final, but then they became final, and we kept pushing. Um, some of our partners mobilized to put together lawsuits that helped with with this injunction. Um, so this is a huge victory um, because that means that there are representatives out there who are thinking of what's needed to be done to protect uh, immigrant families and their kids. Um, so while this injunction is happening, we really want to uh, encourage families to stay enrolled in their benefits and to continue seeking the services that they need um, to be healthy and thriving. Um, we don't want them to disenroll from anything since, not, since the changes haven't happened. Um, but at the same time, we also want to keep encouraging families who think might be at risk um, of being considered a public charge to speak to an immigration attorney and just to be prepared, um, to prepare themselves with whether um, this may impact them or not should it be implemented at, in, in, the, in the future. And then, again, we um, are closely monitoring this issue, so as we have updates, we, we do share that. So um, you could follow, our, follow us on social media on Kids Partnership, and we're constantly um, tweeting about um, where we're at with public charge and sharing resources. So now I can get into what are the new changes to the public charge test. So there's three specific changes that have happened or that are supposed to, um, were supposed to be implemented but are currently on hold. So that was the changing of the definition of public charge, 
um, it is supposed to um, include additional public benefits from what we just covered a little while ago. And then the totality of circumstances um, also looks a little bit differently. And I'll get into those in a second. So in terms of the definition, um, so a, an individual who is likely to become uh, primarily dependent on the government for income is what was defined as uh, a public charge. Now this new definition would say an immigrant who receives one or more benefits um, may be considered a public charge. Um, so there are definitely with these um, proposed changes that are on, finalized changes that are on hold, um, it does look more closely at, at benefits than, than the um, former version did or the, um, what public charge is doing now. So some of the benefits that were added, so actually these are the benefits that were added to um, the public charge changes that again is on hold. Um, so Medicaid was added to the, one, the, the ones on the slide that I had previously shared. Um, however, in terms of Medicaid, it's only federal, federally funded Medicaid. So that means in California, there are some exclusions. Um, so for example, here in California, um, the kids who were able to um, get health coverage through Health for All Kids um, wouldn't be at risk of being considered a public charge for the use of that benefit. Um, uh, pregnant women, uh, new mothers, uh, emergency Medi-Cal. And actually, at the national level, emergency med uh, Medicaid is not considered. Neither is coverage for kids under 21. And pregnant mothers, I mean, pregnant women and uh, new mothers for up to 60 days from giving birth um, would not be uh, at risk of public charge for, for that, those benefits. Another new benefit that was added um, is SNAP or food stamps. We know that as CalFresh in California. Um, they've also included public housing or Section 8, so assistance for, um, for, for public um, housing that's uh, funded at the federal level. Um, and then to the cash assistance piece that we covered earlier, there's a California-based program that is also um, set to be considered, which is a cash assistance program for immigrants, or uh, also known as CAPI. So again, these are the benefits that were added to the public charge test, but, I, but, I, but it's on hold. So folks can continue to use these services. We don't want folks to disenroll um, and, be, um, and risk you know, getting sick or not having uh, access to food or housing. Um, again, the, the proposed changes are on hold, so folks should not worry about the benefits on this line. An important reminder if the, the changes do go into effect is that the use of benefits by any of your relatives does not count. Um, so for example, if I am a parent and I am adjust, I'm applying to adjust my status, if my kid is um, a citizen and is using benefits, um, that, does not, that will not affect my ability to adjust my status. Um, same with the with an undocumented um, partner. Um, the public charge test is an individual test, so it only looks at that person's situation. So if you're an immigrant who hasn't utilized in, um, any of the public benefits listed, then um, but your family does, um, that's okay. That's not going to be considered. Um, and so. This is a really important point to share with, with the folks that you all work with too because um, a lot of immigrant parents have, you know, U.S. born, uh, U.S. citizen kids and also, and even when they have undocumented children, the use of their benefits will not impact them. I think the only exception is if, for example, there's a, a family, a, a child that um, qualified for public housing support um, that one's a little bit trickier just because obviously the parent who might be applying is living in that household. But again, um, we would recommend that an attorney, um, that you speak to an attorney before making any decisions to disenroll from such a key uh, essential benefit such as um, housing support. So there's um, one other important point that, that's, that we want to continue to emphasize 
is all the benefits that are not included in the public charge rule. Um, so basically, any benefits that you don't see on here um, will not be considered for the public charge test. These are just some of the ones that, are, that we want to highlight. So again, funded Medi-Cal, um, Medicare Part D, any uh, emergency and disaster relief assistance, services that are available to the entire community. So for example, if folks are seeking care at a community health center, um, that will not uh, impact a, a person when um, applying to adjust their status. School nutrition services, um, public education, including Head Start, the WIC program, um, covered California tax credits, um, and any like uh, um, earned income tax credit, health tax credit, um, benefits that you earn through your employment, um, again, benefits received by um, your dependents. So none of these benefits put you at risk of um, becoming a public charge test. Again, if a benefit is not on this list or on the list that I showed you all at the beginning, there's nothing to worry about. But even with that, again, um, the changes are on hold right now, should, so folks should not be disenrolling um, and should be talking to an attorney when making a decision about whether they should disenroll or not. So I'm just going to pause for a quick second because I do see a question on here. So if the changes happen, will immigrant families have to disenroll from public benefits or will there be an exclusion for California since a lot of our programs are state-run? So if the changes do happen, um, we we really want to emphasize to families that um, they should again that there's a hold on the changes, so don't do not disenroll currently. If the changes were to be implemented before a family decides to disenroll, we really strongly urge them to to speak to an attorney um, because there's different things that are going, that are going to be looked are going to be looked at. Um, for example, how long they've been using their benefits. So for example, if a person were to apply, so say that it was implemented on Tuesday, if a person were to apply, the use, the, their use of benefits before the implementation date wouldn't apply for the new benefits. Um, and then moving forward, um, again, we want them to speak to an attorney because some of these services are essential, right? So getting your, your health coverage getting um, you know, your, the, the food stamps, um, housing assistance, they're all really important benefits that folks need to stay healthy and thrive. And, and we do acknowledge that these changes are, are basically putting families in a predicament of choosing between having these essential benefits um, and keeping their family together. So this is a really difficult one. Um, but before they make the decision of disenrolling, we really um, urge folks to speak to an attorney. In terms of um, California-based programs, uh, yes, so they're, they're state-funded programs with the, with the exception of CAPI are not going to be considered for the public charge test, but what I do want to know is that most folks don't know whether the, fund the program that they're utilizing is state-funded or federally funded. Um, in the case of Medi-Cal, for example, there is a form that when folks are applying to adjust their status, um, I believe it's called the I-944, there are a few boxes where you have to fill out which benefits um, you are utilizing. And so there is a question on there that says, are you utilizing Medicaid? Um, and so, for example, if, if I am an 18-year-old that in California qualified for Medi-Cal through, through Health for All Kids, I would not click that box because Health for All Kids is a state-funded program. However, um, this is just a really uh, complex piece to explain to folks. And again, not most folks don't know whether a program is federally or state-funded, which is why, again, it's so important to refer folks to, to an attorney for, for that, for support. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> that was my long answer. Okay, so in terms of the changes to the totality of circumstances, the factors that, I'm, that are included on this uh, slide are very similar to the ones that you saw earlier.
However, they just have a little bit more weight put on them. Um, so for example, in terms of age, they are looking heavily uh, in terms of whether you're under the age of 18 or you're over the age of 60. They're working with the assumption that if you're too young or you're too old, that you may need government support. Um, or for example, if you have a physical or mental health condition that may inhibit your ability to work or go to school, they're taking a look at that. Or whether you're insurable, whether you're coming into the country with health insurance. Um, so, so it's the same factors as before, but they're, they're just putting a little bit more weight on specific components. And then, for example, on the income side, they are looking for, for, for greater income. So, for example, more than $62,000 for a family of four, which we know that's very difficult, especially when in low-income communities. Um, but, but that would be looked at as a positive factor. If you have an affidavit of support, that's still considered a positive factor. Um, if you have English proficiency, um, that was actually, that is actually a new factor that they're looking at. Um, and um, but it is a, it is considered a positive factor to have English proficiency. But again, we know that this poses a lot of challenges um, to the immigrant community. Um, and again, this is just part of those attempts to try to make the face of immigrants look different in this country. So uh, what's happening now? So. I know that this is all um, scary. This is something that we've been monitoring for a long time. We know um, that the impact of public charge would be greater than, than the actual impact, just because um, you know families hear that the usage of benefits can, can you know, potentially lead to a family separation. So of course there's going to be fear, but, but we do want to ask people to remain calm when the changes are on hold and two, um, it doesn't. But the public charge doesn't doesn't apply to everyone. So we just want to keep emphasizing those points. Um, and then the rule is also not retroactive. So if it were to be implemented, um, they would only be looking at the usage of of the new benefits that were added from that date forward. Not anything that happened before that, except for those two original categories of benefits that I mentioned the cash benefits and the uh, long-term uh, medical care. So um, I know that I just shared a lot of information. Um, so we did want to do a little bit of a quiz um, just to see if folks are, um, if I'm clear <laughs> on what the proposed changes to public charge are. I really want to emphasize that again, not every immigrant will be subject to the public charge test. And that's really what I'm trying to assess here. Um, to think about it from a broader perspective, if you are an immigrant or you're working with an immigrant who currently doesn't even have a, a possible pathway to adjust their status, then they should not be worried about public charge test. They should not be worried about disenrolling from the services, right? If, if for example, I am uh, an undocumented parent and I am married, to another undocumented person, there's no way for us currently to adjust our status unless, say, an amnesty passed. So we should not be worried about public charge test. Um, however, if, for example, I am an undocumented parent and my child is a U.S. born citizen, and when they turn 21, they want to look into petitioning me to adjust my status, then I would um, recommend, you know, seeking. An, an attorney and just talking to them about, about our situation and and helping and them helping us make the best um, determination for um, our usage of public benefits. Um, so just a little bit of a quiz. Um, so I'm gonna ask that. Oh, one second. We do have a question. Uh, so the question is: Will the parents of DACA recipients or DAPA be subject to the test? So um, for starters, the DAPA pro program didn't come to fruition, so, so there were no, no applications for DAPA. But in terms of um, DACA recipients, um, so again, 
if, for example, I am the parent of a DACA recipient, but I don't actually have any legal protections for myself, I won't be impacted by public charge. This only applies to people who are currently attempting to adjust their status. On the case of a DACA recipient, DACA, DACA is simply a um, protection. It's, it, it's not a form of like legal status. So uh, a DACA recipient currently isn't subject to the public charge test. However, if say a DACA recipient were to get married to a US citizen and were seeking to adjust their status, then we recommend that they go speak to an attorney because if they utilized one of the public benefits included, then they may be impacted. Um, but if they currently also don't have a pathway to adjust and, and um, uh, remove the DACA status to a legal permanent status, um, then they shouldn't worry about public charge. Um, okay, so quiz time. I am gonna ask folks, once I review the, the questions, if you can take a moment and write yes or no in the chat, um, and we'll see if, if um, you got the right answers. So here's an example. So Alejandra, um, she has a U visa, and she lives with her 90-year-old daughter, Yami. They receive CalFresh, CalWorks, and Medi-Cal. She heard rumors that CalFresh and Medi-Cal will now negatively affect immigrants under the, under the new public charge rule. Should they continue to receive their services or should they uh, disenroll? So if folks can, can input yes, they should continue to receive services or no, for they should not. And I'll give a minute for folks to, to start chiming in. Okay, so I'm not seeing any answers come in. Oh, we have two yes responses. So folks are saying, yes, they should continue to receive services. Let's find out if they are right. Yes, the answer is they should continue to receive services. So again, people who apply for a U visa um, or have a U visa um, will not be affected by the public charge test because they are part of the exempt category. Um, there are many immigrants, again, who are not required to take the public char charge test, and they fall on, uh, Alejandra falls under this category. If you're not sure, if you, you're, um, uh, if you are a part of the, these exempted categories, then we recommend that you consult with a lawyer. So question number two. So Diana is undocumented. Um, she has spoken with an immigration lawyer and she found out that there are no visas for which she is currently eligible for. She lives with her son, Daniel, who's four, and who is a U.S. citizen. Daniel receives CalWORKs, Medi-Cal, and CalFresh, and they have no other income. Are they affected by public charge rules? Please write either yes or no. Okay, I'm seeing some no's. That's right. So no, not, not right now. So Diana does not currently have a path to obtain a visa or a green card. So her son's use of benefits will not affect her. If she thinks she can apply for a visa in the future, then she should consult with a lawyer to ask if a public charge will affect her. But currently, it will not. So folks are correct. And the last question. So let's take a look at Diana's case again. Um, again, she's undocumented and she has a son his, whose name is Daniel, who's a US citizen. Diana wants to marry a citizen of the United States and could be eligible for an immigrant visa for a spouse, for being the spouse of a US citizen. Diana and Daniel receive work benefits. Daniel also receives free breakfast and lunch at school. Should Diana stop using her benefits? Please enter yes or no. OK, 
Okay, so I'm seeing some no's and I, and I see one yes. The answer is no. Um, so she and her son can continue to receive services. So WIC and school services are not considered public charge, um, are not considered under the, under the changes for the public charge test. So even if the new rule passes and is implemented, these benefits will remain unaffected. Um, if you are receiving a benefit and are not sure if they will be impacted by a pu um, public charge, please consult with the lawyer. But again, school services, school-based services, and programs like WIC or Head Start um, or state-funded Madden Cal will not be considered for the public charge test. So if folks are utilizing those services, they should not disenroll. So thank you all so much for, for um, engaging in my little quiz. And um, I'm glad that um, folks got the right answers. So just as some key messages to share um, with you all and for you all to, um, to also share with when folks are asking you questions around public charge is, again, the test does not apply to everyone. Everyone's case is different. There are many families who receive public services but are not subject to the test. Um, so please don't um, think Encourage folks to not assume that they will be considered a public charge because they heard of someone who might. Um, again, everybody's case looks different. Public charge is an individual test. So any services or benefits used by someone in your family will not affect, should not be affecting you. So please also emphasize that point. Again, public charge is not retroactive. So services used before the implementation begins should not count against your case unless they are part of the original benefits that were part of public charge. And as I continue to emphasize, um, we recommend that folks seek legal um, support to inform themselves of whether their um, case could be at risk due to uh, an implementation of public charge. Let me see, I think there's another question here. Are direct health services provided out of public school through an IEP negative factors? No, so no. So again, any school-based um, services would not, would not be considered for a public charge test. Um, so feel free to, feel free to um, share that with folks. Um, and again, if they do think that there's a benefit that might impact them, again, seek legal support, but, but school-provided services are not included. They're not negative factors. So just a, um, a quick slide on some resources. We are a part of a national campaign, the Protecting Immigrant Families campaign, um, that has put out a ton of resources to talk about public charge um, in multiple languages, actually. So if you visit protectingimmigrantfamilies.org, there's a section called Know Your Rights, and they have, again, a lot of um, documents, they have some core community messages, they have a let's talk about public charge, they have um, um, sort of like a stop lights of uh, whether you should be concerned or not, um, and then they have just some additional information about, around public charge. So I really urge folks to go on there. Um, you can print those materials and share them with, with your community. Um, at the Children's Partnership, we're also working on a sort of roadmap uh, on public charge. So we are hoping that as soon as we have that ready to go that we'll share it with um, with you all. So, um, and th this is a document that we've been working on for a while because we wanted to make sure that it was responsive to the needs of the community and that it was easy to understand. Um, and so we did get input from a lot of our partners who work with folks on the ground um, to make sure that this was a, a community-friendly document. So we will share this as soon as we have have it finalized. Um, so um, you can also go on our website. We do have a public charge section. Um, and again, here we have linked a lot of our, the resources that our partners have put together. Um, we have a video, an informational video that can be shared if you're doing a presentation or on your social media. Um, and we have other resources on there. So I do encourage folks to visit it. Um, I can, I just realized I didn't write that, include the actual links for these two legal resources, but we can include them in the chat box. Um, the, there, there's two lists of legal support for public charge that we're really recommending folks to go to. One of them was um, put together and vetted 
by the California Department of Social Services. And then the other one, um, the Ready California list, is actually um, a list of attorneys who are um, receiving state funds to provide free legal support to um, immigrants. So we, again, really recommend for folks to point families in that direction. Um, and then also, we wanted to share about this uh, great new tool. Um, the Legal Aid of San Mateo County has put together a texting um, tool. So basically, you can either text in English benefits or Libre in Spanish to the phone number included here. Um, and for a person who is thinking that they may be in charge, I mean, they might, they might be impacted by public charge, um, it'll ask you a set of questions. You do not have to put any personal information. It'll basically give you like yes, no questions or like select A, B, or C. And it'll walk you through this series of questions and at the end it will tell you um, you are not at risk for public charge or you may be at risk, please seek legal support. And at that, and at that point, if you choose to, you can input your zip code and then it will direct you to um, legal support in your area. So I, we really are recommending for folks to try this um, this texting tool. Um, I believe it, it will be available um, on the web in a few weeks, but currently it's a texting tool. So um, please try it out yourselves. Um, please share it with folks. Again, it doesn't ask you for any personal information, so you should not be worried about this um, getting in the wrong hands or affecting you. This is just a tool to help you understand whether you should be worried about public charge or not, should it be implemented. Um, I also just wanted to share really quickly, um, we are working with the Los Angeles County Office of Education. They do have an immigrant relations coordinator. We wanted to share it with you all specifically because you work in schools in school settings. Um, and we just think this is a model that can be replicated throughout the state. Um, we just recommend for schools and school districts and offices of education to um, take a proactive role in making sure that their students, um, their staff, their families um, have access to um, supportive resources um, during these times. So we just wanted to share a little bit about what LACO is doing um, you know, in case you're interested in doing any advocacy at your local um, schools to make sure that um, we're all doing our part to protect immigrant families and students. So if you want to learn more, you can contact Carolina Scheinfield. Here's her information. Um, these are just some of the focus areas for this department. Um, so providing support to accompany minors, access to public resources, providing technical assistance. They monitor raids that are being rumored. Um, and they look at the effect that it has on children. And they have a, web, a website where they share a list of local resources that are available in LA for immigrant families. So again, this is just, a, if you're doing some uh, on the ground advocacy at your schools, um, this is a good model to take a look at. Um, I did just want to go quickly over other ways in which we can be supporting uh, immigrant families, but we do have 10 minutes left, and so I also want to answer more questions. Um, so uh, I know that the um, that on the California School Based Health Alliance website, there's a recording from a webinar I did last year that focuses on this specific issue of um, safe schools um, for all students, including immigrant and refugee students. Um, so you can get more information on there. So that's sort of what I wanted to go over in this component, but I think I'm going to um, stop here and open it up for, for questions. Um, the webinar I mentioned focuses on AB 699, um, so you can get that information there. Um, just really quickly, AB 699 um, is a law that requires schools to take specific actions to make sure that uh, immigrant students and their families feel safe on school campuses. So some of the, the requirements that it had was, you know, it encouraged, encouraged encourages teachers to um, talk to students about the harm of bullying, particularly based on immigration status. It prohibits immigration status information from being gathered from students or families, um, say like at enrollment time. Um, it requires the school board to, um, 
to notify if police officers or immigration officers are trying to enforce their laws on campuses. It recommends that a school follows a family's emergency plan and avoids referrals to CPS. Um, and it informs parents about a children's right to a free public education um, and about school policies to assist assistance with ICE. So um, if you're interested in, in uh, either learning what your school is doing or encouraging your school to take some of these um, steps, um, please feel free to contact us and we're happy to provide some support in doing that. Um, and here we were just highlighting one of our uh, research studies on the impact of the anti-immigrant climate and the effect it has on the, on the mental health and well-being of children and immigrant families. Um, and we wanted to just highlight some of the, the key um, recommendations that came out um, as part of that research. Um, and two of them, one of them focuses on strengthening community safety, which is so important for us to talk about you know, making sure that families feel safe at schools and taking the necessary steps to provide those protections. And then another one is just how important it is to build the capacity of folks such as yourselves who um, are providers who are working directly with these impacted families. So I just wanted to highlight that very quickly. And so um, how um, you can provide support, we just want you to spread the word. We want to be able to, to make you spreading the word easily. So if, um, our resources are um, available on our website. They're, you can download them. We have a link on our website so that you can order forms, um, some of our flyers, um, and we will send them to you at no cost. So I recommend that you all visit our website for that. Um, and we want to work with you all on making sure that you have the tools that you have. So if any of you have any ideas of what resources we should be creating to support immigrant families, we welcome you to, to reach out to us and we can see what we can do about that. And then again, um, it's just important to advocate um, at your schools, making sure that the school, schools are taking the right steps to ensure their parents know their rights um, and that they're implementing um, policies that will help students feel safe on campus. So now I'll really open it up for questions. Um, so I'm not sure, I think I was addressing the questions that I was seeing on the Q&A chat, but I'm not sure if there are additional questions or if folks would like me to expand on something specific. So Aurora, there, there were question? yes, there's um, a few questions that I don't know if you're able to see, but uh, we did receive a question earlier on um, from the chat, um, and they're asking, uh, do you have an easy to understand one pager um, on this that refers to DACA, the Dream Act, um, immigrants, etc.? Yeah. Um, so I. As I mentioned, at TCP, we're working on a specific public charge document that um, we would like to re release soon. Um, we also do have some, uh, we do have a flyer on our, on our allinforhealth.org website where um, it talks a little bit about, about DACA. Um, I would be happy to share with Peter so you can uh, share also some of our partners, um, like at NILK, they have some information a little, that's a little bit broader than that, so including the DACA, DACA the DREAM Act, other immigrant um, policy, so I can share that with folks. Um, but in terms of a one-pager that talks about all of these, we don't have one, but that's a great suggestion because I know it's, it's hard when you have a, you know, a gazillion resources available. So thank you for that. Um, I do see another question. Um, what would be the best and most effective way to support our immigrant families at our schools? So I think one is for you all to, you know, educate yourselves on these issues. So you're all on here on the webinar wanting to learn about that because, um, you know, you probably want to be able to answer questions. So I'm happy to connect you all to the resources to have that. So just having that information yourself would be helpful. Um, Sharing some of those legal resources, um, I think, would also be a great way to support immigrant families. Um, I think even just speaking to families um, from the perspective of, like, we know that you're hearing a lot. We know there's a lot of changes that are being rumored, um, and we're here to support you. 
um, and then just offering to connect them to the right right help. Um, again, I really recommend, I, I was actually playing with the, the texting screening app that I just, uh, screening tool that I just talked about. Um, and if you do put your zip code in the end, you can um, identify some resources that are in your area. So like as a provider at your school-based health center, if you just want to do that, just to have that list of legal resources, I would really recommend that. Um, and then again, on the, the two um, links that I, I am sharing, um, you can also um, find legal support in your area. Uh, we got a question in the chat. Um, how are home visiting programs impacted by public charge? Examples, maternal child health and nurse family partnership. Um, that is a great question. Um, I'm not sure if those services are funded at the state level or at the federal level. I assume not because it wasn't included in the list, but um, I will check in with our folks. And, and, and Peter, is it okay if I send you the response and you can share that with folks? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, this this... I hadn't heard this question, but it's a great question, so I'm definitely making note of it, and then I will report back. And then I just want to make sure that um, this question was really addressed, um, but we got one in the Q&A. Uh, are direct health services provided at a public school through an IEP, negative factors? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, and let me go back to that slide. Um, if if um, the benefits are provided via the school, um, it would not be considered a public charge. So they, that would not be a negative factor. But again, we really want to stay away from um, telling folks a straight yes or no, and we really want to urge them to speak to an attorney just to be on the safe side. Um, but if, if um, they're not included on this list here, the family should be good to go. Great, and that concludes um, our webinar for today. Thank you so much, Aurora, um, for your time and everyone um, for joining us in this conversation today. Uh, so I do want to um, just close out uh, with um, our contact information um, in case you have uh, further uh, questions um, for Aurora or myself. Um, Um, so you can follow uh, the Children's Partnership um, there. Aurora's email um, is listed there as well. Um, and in the next uh, slide, um, uh, you can also follow uh, the California School-Based Health Alliance um, on our social media platforms. Um, and my email is also there um, if you have any questions or would like to get connected um, with Aurora. Um, and last but not least, um, I will end and um, um, invite you all to join us um, at our annual California School-Based Health Conference um, in Sacramento this year from May 14th to 15th. Uh, more information uh, will be available uh, on our website. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone, so much for your participation.